everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Ignacio Dallo. Welcome to the first ICRS webinar series in 2021, entitled Case Base, Run Table, Next Gen, Knee Joint Preservation, What on the Horizon. We have a truly exceptional faculty presenting clinical research on meniscal repair, cell-based cartilage restoration, and knee osteotomy. First of all, we want to thank Gaislik, the sponsor of the webinar. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our committee chairman, Dr. Seth Sherman from Stanford University. He will talk to you about the ICRS Next Gen Mission and Vision. Please, Seth, the screen is yours. Thanks, Ignacio. Let me know when you can see my screen. And you can hear me? Yeah, perfect. So uh, thanks for having me. And uh, really, uh, thanks to our group for uh, doing this. Uh, there's a uh, tremendous uh, interest and excitement in ICRS in general and in NextGen. Um, just wanted to share a few things about what we're doing uh, as the NextGen committee, who we are, uh, and what our goals are. So I am the chair of this committee, along with uh, Jorge Chala and Cassandra Lee. Uh, Cassandra is with us today. And then uh, you can see our other uh, incredible working uh, members. So our mission is really to identify and facilitate the next generation cartilage surgeons and scientific leaders. And so we'll achieve this goal by maintaining a scholarly and social collaborative network to link the present generation of thought leaders with the next generation. So that's really what we're all about. This is how we're going to do it uh, and how we are doing it through meetings like this education, through linking surgeon scientists, uh, collaborative research. Uh, we think it's very important uh, to have mentorship within ICRS. So finding ways for this next generation of either new members or young members uh, to link up with some of the current generation thought leaders uh, and the legends uh, who have really shaped our path uh, in knee joint preservation and in um, cartilage restoration and biologics in general. Uh, social media engagement uh, is a quite low hanging fruit way for us young people to stay together and to network. And so um, we had a really nice presence at the last uh, uh, World Congress. We plan on having the same or bigger presence at this Congress with uh, speaker sessions, uh, with uh, smaller group sessions focused for the young surgeon scientists. And uh, of course, with our uh, large uh, happy hour, uh, hopefully, um, uh, by that time, uh, pandemic uh, has uh, passed uh, and we'll be able to share a wonderful time together getting to know each other. And so uh, it's really on you to get involved. It's exciting to see that over 300 people registered for this webinar. Um, and I'm sure, um, you know, we really want to attract uh, you to join ICRS in general. And you can please join us on uh, Facebook, uh, the ICRS Next Gen Group. Uh, Ignacio does a nice job of uh, getting information on there uh, with the rest of our team about what uh, is up next for us. And that's a good way to pass information. So with that, I'll turn it back to start our webinar, but um, really appreciate uh, your time and attention and uh, let's have some fun and learn. Thanks, Ignacia. Thank you very much, Dr. Sherman. Before we begin, one remains, please feel free to use the Q&A button to ask your questions. And also you can upvote the question that you find interesting. I would like to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Thomas Piontek from Rio Sport in Poland. He will present expanding indication for meniscal repair. Please Thomas, share your screen. We, we don't hear you. Thomas, Thomas would we, you we, turn we, on your, your microphone, please? Again, sorry. I'm sorry. Very sorry. No problem. OK. Oh. Sorry. Um, 
I'm sorry, I'm very happy that I'm here. I don't know what's happened, but I would like to present my, my presentation to cases uh, and then uh, present expanding indications for meniscus repair. The first case will be 27 years old female with the complex lateral meniscus injury. It was not contact injury of the right knee, uh, twisting injury, pain and swelling. And painful ROM was from 30 degree to 120. Uh, McMurray test uh, was positive and Lachman test also positive. Radiograms uh, are normal, normal and alignment normal and posterior tibial slope also normal. In MRI, we can see here the bracket handle, just meniscus inside the, the meniscus in, 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 in the sagittal plane. And coronal also we can find here in the place uh, meniscus. And uh, what we saw in, in arthroscopy, it was full and stable meniscus um, inside the, 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 the knee and block the knee. And the question was, is what we can do in such a meniscus? We can not operative treatment, nothing, or partial meniscectomy, or meniscus repair. But if we know, if we do lateral menis meniscectomy, uh, is the case of death of the, of the knee. And this is the case of the patient, I resected the meniscus many years ago, 17 years old football player. And after nine years, it was a really serious degeneration, arthrosis of the knee. We know from literature, from papers then uh, if we do meniscectomy, we create residual post-operative laxity. And also we know exactly that meniscus protect the cartilage. And it means that we should save the meniscus. And what uh, repair the meniscus, what surgical technique we would use for this? Outside in or, or, or inside or inside out or hybrid repair? Augmentation, the question, would we perform an embryological augmentation taking, for example, PRP, BMAC, or uh, a clot of the, of the blood inside the meniscus? And what we did. And uh, the first of all, it's very important to stabilize meniscus and, of course, refresh the injury. I use it for first a very new, very nice instrument. This is Novo Stitch Pro. And we can suture the meniscus just into the meniscus, is, is suturing without any connecting with the capture. And um, here, first, we precise to stabilize meniscus with the two sutures, uh, like you can see it. And just anything that in the place. The second is uh, in the posterior part. Uh, I would like, I use normally the, the, the inside, all inside. And then second um, possibility for suturing with novel stitch. And then we can see how we stabilize meniscus inside. And it's really hybrid um, uh, suturing repair of the meniscus. Again, the, the other uh, um, novel stitch. And here on the last two sutures with the outside in, a very cheap suturing stabilized for the, the, the anterior corner of the, of the meniscus. The second case that I would like to present is the very difficult for treatment is the radial medial uh, tear in the man, 40 years old man. There was no contact injury of the left knee, twisting injury, pain, swelling, and locking. The pain full run went from 110 to 120. And McMurray test, of course, positive and Lachman test negative. Radiograms also normal. MRI, we can observe and we can see in this. Uh, scans, um, the tear of the medial uh, meniscus, the radial combined, and what we saw in, in arthroscopy, the typical unstable radial tear of the meniscus. And also we have the question, how would we treat this tear? Do nothing or do partial meniscectomy or meniscus repair? We know that if we do meniscectomy, we can provide really arthrosis of the knee. This is the example for 43 years old man after meniscectomy, after five, four years, we, we really it was damaged cartilage on the medial compartment. We know that if we will suture meniscus um, in the normal without any, any augmentation technique or any other procedures, we can achieve not so good results. And Frank Arnoczki presented three years ago for 54% good results in such a, such a ruptures, such a injuries of the meniscus. And if we agree with the safe, uh, 
what kind of sutures we will use, or inside, inside out, hybrid, or outside in, and also augmentation technique, what we would like to, to choose, the PRP or BMEC, or the exogenous free blink clots, and or wrapping. This is the questions, and also we know exactly we everybody has the answer. Or you would like to perform any other procedures presented, for example, resection and do some implant of collagen, menaflex, or, or active heat, or other special um, procedures like presented by Kamimura, for example, um, fragments of cartilage of the meniscus, put it inside with the uh, clot, um, blood clot inside the, the, the rupture of the, where we, in the radial tear of the meniscus. And what we've done, and this is instable meniscus, uh, typical. And in, in the first, we refresh the, the, the borders of, of, of the meniscus and then stabilize. Very important, stabilize meniscus. I, in my hands, I like very much inside out. We can do many sutures. We can stabilize the, the very precisely the meniscus, the, the fragments together. And then I do augmentation technique. This is the chondroguide membrane, collagen membrane, a special instrument device. This is the GOAT. And we put this membrane uh, on this instrument to be sure that it's in, in, in good place. And then in a, such a prepared membrane, we put uh, to, the, to the joint, like here. And first we stabilize membrane on, with the fast fix or all inside, uh, just on the posterior corner to be sure the membrane uh, will be in, 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 on the meniscus. Then we can stabilize how we would like to do. And for me, the very nice is uh, inside out technique. Um, we should, should remember that the membrane is only for covering, augmentation. Then we take the, the bone marrow, fluid bone marrow from, from the notch just above the ACL. And we, in dry atroscopy, we put this um, and, and the blood bone marrow just between the membrane and meniscus. And we, in this, such a technique, we, uh, uh, we know from our research that we can achieve good results in 90% after five, eight years. And of course, rehabilitation, the short slides is the same like for the previous um, um, patient and, and this with the wrapping just the two weeks with maximal 90 degree and full uh, motion after that, uh, partial weight bearing four weeks, then full weight bearing, uh, full fraction after four weeks, and return to sport is depend of the uh, physical assessment three, six months after operation. Thank you very much for attention. Excellent presentation, fascinating approach to treat meniscal tear, Dr. Piontek. Thank you very um, much. I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, is the scaffold absorbable and how long does it take to be reabsorbed and replace it by meniscal tissue? Okay. This membrane is absorbable. This is the same membrane we use for the amic procedure. And um, the membrane, uh, I think what we know from the in vitro investigations from Geislich, that's uh, resolvable after a couple of weeks, six weeks. But uh, it means that the, the collagen membrane, this membrane is very friendly for, for cells. And if we put there the, the stem cells taken from the bone marrow or concentrated bone marrow, BMEC, then we know exactly that these um, cells are on, on this menisco, on, on this membrane. And then we create, we create this, such a chamber between the meniscus and membrane. And why I think I, we have good results in such a very difficult injuries of the meniscus because the membrane starts to be in the future, the cartilage. Uh, we saw that in, the, in some cases because we've done uh, from this 10 years, more than 400 such operations. And I put camera a couple of times inside and we saw the really the, the, the formation of the tissue on, on the healed uh, meniscus. Perfect, thank you. I have a question from the audience, uh, Jivan Pereira. Uh, do you allow weight bearing once meniscus has healed? How do you confirm the repair or, or the healing of the meniscus? Of, um, 
this, of, of course, everything depends on the physical examination. I am allowed to walk without um, weight bearing if the patient had no pain and we have no swelling. And normally it's a, um, between the four, five, three weeks, it depends on the case. And of course, in, for me, very important is after when I'm allowed to put patient for all uh, to sport, to, to recovering to sport, to do, of course, the um, physical examination this is for our uh, biomechanical uh, um, evaluation and also MRI. And if I see that everything in the place is no swelling, no pain, because clinical examination is the most important, we know that, then, of course, patient is um, allowed for, for, for finish treatment and start to, to do everything what he wants. Perfect. Hey, uh, may I make a comment? Yeah. Yes, please. Tomas, that's a great presentation. You know, you've taken some heroic and admirable measures to save the meniscus, and I think it's really, really the key message. I just find it interesting that after all that heroic uh, effort that uh, we're not bracing and we're not limiting weight bearing, particularly on some of the tear patterns that might splay apart uh, with weight bearing. So I find with vertical longitudinal tears where, you know, or horizontal where you might weight bear, and I do, but for the ones you showed uh, where the joints at risk, I just, I just wonder your rationale. Do you not have braces available or are you choosing not to uh, protect them? Yeah, I use the brace uh, just sometimes when we learn anything the MCL because it's very pain painful because if you would like to go just the medial compartment, we we needling the M MCL and it's pain I, I had such operation a couple of years ago and it really is the, the painful. Then, then I use the, the, the um, orthesis on, on brace uh, for the knee, but normally if it's not, uh, I'm, I'm not using any. For the beginning of, of uh, sport or of the walking normally, also I, I don't prefer to use the brace. Why? Because I would like to, to be sure that the patient is working with his muscles because I, for me, the 50% of success is the physical examination and very good cooperation with, with physios. Then then we allowed to to you know to to the possibility to to start normal walking running is depend everything of the of the of the physical examination. I guess American patients are less compliant, uh, Cassandra, and I have to brace them and protect them early. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I mean, I think that's fantastic data, Tomas. Uh, looking at not protecting these very complex tears that you worry about them s splitting apart. So. Yeah. Yes, thanks a lot. There is, there is one more question from the audience. Uh, AJ Susana Paris, he, she asked, uh, what are your, um, what is your, your options available when you have a um, buckle handle tear with locking knee? Um, I, I try to really save the meniscus and uh, I'm agree also with the Charlie Brown and other, other doctors from over the world and really we should uh, save and the suture and we and the buckle handle we can use really uh, many sutures just to suture to the capsule is uh, very good devices for the inside out technique and I know that many of us are using such devices and we can create very good stabilization the same like for the allograft transplantation 20 15 sutures and then if I do that I'm exactly know that everything is in place and I'm not very mm, nervous about four weeks that the, the back of hand could be again that uh, and stabilization I think is the key for good treatment of the meniscus. Okay Mohammed uh, Maniru Saman ask uh, if early way bearing could damage biologic cells in the healing process. What's your thoughts about this? Um, I don't know, because this is very, very good question, because maybe in the future, in a couple of years, everybody will agree that we walk just after operation, after suturing. We don't know, because we need more researchers about it to cooperate very with um, assessment. I think when I see my patients, uh, well, they are walking with the full weight bearing after operation just with the straight knee that really a fusion the, the swelling disappear and we know exactly that it's very important to have the good quality of the quadriceps and then i think um, the four weeks is enough it's really do enough. you 
Perfect. Um, Jivan Pereira asks if do you have experience treating with this technique, discoid, discoid lateral meniscal tears? Yes. Um, I had such a couple of patients, the special, the youngest was the nine years old, with really damaged uh, the discoid meniscus. We create the, the shape of the natural meniscus and uh, the quality of the of this meniscus was were not so good and why I cover after suturing, after stabilization with the membrane and we had a good result. I, I, I had in, in the past one patient when I resect the, the because it was destroyed and I resect the discoid meniscus and really patient with after five, seven years when he had the 15 years old we really had the problem with the cartilage and we should really save the discoid meniscus in the shape of natural meniscus and if we need the augmentation technique this is, depend of in your hands or the BMAC or this is a um, PRP or membrane that really works, really works in the white zone, especially. Tomas, I had one more question. Um, so uh, bone marrow taken from the notch, uh, I assume, are you concentrating that? No, we, if I would like to concentrate BMAC, I take from the, the crest, iliac crest. Okay, so yeah, got it. So no, this is non-concentrated BMA. Okay. No, yes, because we can achieve, we can take only about five, 10 millimeters of the bone marrow from the notch. And this is not so enough for concentrate. Okay. And so do, do you ever, do you ever, to get more cells, go to the ASIS or other sources or not for meniscus repair? We now change our approach and now we, we, we are using the, the, the BMEC for, for the meniscus for new research to see that we have the better quality of the scar in meniscus because if I now I, I, we, we, we prepared the paper 10 years observation our, our after uh, um, patient after augmentation technique and we know exactly that the meniscus exists in place it's not extruded but the shape sometimes not looks beautiful. I think this depends on the scars, the, the, the sutures, the, the treats there. And I hope if I will achieve good, uh, better scar inside, then I, I will achieve the better MRI after years. And then why we, we start to use BMAC for our research to compare with the control group, which is a normal, uh, normal bone marrow. And just lastly, why not PRP? PRP because on the 10 years ago we started this uh, our project uh, PRP was not available because this is now the new technology and why I, I do still the bone marrow PRP I think we can do that also but we can add it to the bone to to the bone marrow because PRP uh, has the, the enzymes and other other um, things which were helpful for for healing, but not cells, and why I, I prefer the cells from from bone marrow. When uh, we also well, done in vitro, in vitro on the collagen membrane, and then the concentrate bone marrow is better than normal normal uh, normal uh, fluid uh, bone marrow, and also we know exactly that is better than than uh, fat pet, and why I think the future for our hands will be the BMAC, concentrate bone marrow. Sorry, Thomas. One quick question: Why don't you preload the membrane with, with the BMEC? You prefer to inject after you put the membrane on the meniscus, but don't you think it would be suitable to soak the membrane in the BMEC before putting inside the joint? Very difficult is putting membrane on the dry arthroscopy, and why we we, we should use the, the the normal fluids, and then why if I will put the, the bone marrow or BMEC to the membrane before then maybe the, the old cells will be disappear. And why we use the dry atroscopy and on the end, and in dry atroscopy, we put the, the bone marrow or concentrated bone marrow inside between membrane and meniscus because membrane is, uh, is uh, absorbable for, 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 for cells inside. And why the porous, um, because the control guide um, so two, two spheres, two surfaces. One surface is porous and one is dense. And this porous surfaces we put on the meniscus, the same like for the cartridge reconstruction. Okay, thank you. Okay, perfect. We will proceed with the next speaker, Berardo. So, the thank you, Ignacio. 
My name is Berardo Di Matteo from Italy, and now we move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Cassandra Lee, who is going to present her talk titled Incorporating Macy into Your Practice. Please, Cassandra, the stage is yours. Hello. All right. So I am trying to get my slides coming up. So bear with me. There we go. All right. Well, good morning from the West Coast of the United States. I want to say hello and talk to you about uh, incorporating cell-based therapies into your practice. A lot of information I'm going to be presenting, unfortunately, is available only in the United States because, um, yeah. So <laughs> anyways, next. So I'm going to go through three different cases. Uh, the first case is going to be a 41-year-old male construction worker. He, was a, he is a runner and avid cyclist now. He's had a complex history about knee issues. Um, with the, basically presenting with a two-year history of medial-sided knee pain. Um, he had a history of a PCL reconstruction 21 years ago after a fall off a bike, and then about eight years ago had a chondroplasty and a microfracture of the medial femoral condyle. Um, prior to coming in to see me, he had an arthroscopy and medial meniscectomy, and then another chondroplasty of that medial femoral condyle. He felt great, but then he tripped and fell, and then the knee has never felt the same ever since. So he's had steroid and visco injections, but he has no relief. He's also done physiotherapy. On exam, you can see that his alignment is fairly normal. He has some preserved joint space, but he does, does have some secondary osteoarthritis changes with some flattening of the condyle. Um, he has otherwise ligamentously stable and no meniscal signs. MRI shows that he has an isolated large condyle defect of the medial condyle that you can see with that blue area with also a small interlesional osteophyte within that area, and, and the meniscus is intact. So that's our case number one. Um, and this is what it looks like from a scope standpoint. So you can see he does have a large grade four lesion, um, about 3.5 3 centimeters by two centimeters, so fairly large, almost encompassing the entire, entirety of the condyle. Our next case is a 38-year-old female um, a nurse anesthetist who is very active, surfer, runner, former triathlete. Um, She's came, come in with a history of four to five years of issues with her knee, mostly with knee extension. Very complex case, has had a history of uh, ACL with a BTB auto that was revised with an allograft. Um, all of the courses have been complicated by arthrofibrosis. And then she developed um, chronic regional pain syndrome because of this. Um, prior to presenting, she had a scope and a notchplasty. So to open up that area thinking that maybe the ACL was impinging, um, and then she actually did well with that. Uh, still didn't reach full extension, but then um, she again presented with some difficulty with extension. On exam, pretty, exa pretty benign. There's no fusion, but she did have a loss of terminal extension from five degrees to about 115 degrees. No joint line tenderness, ligamentously stable, um, and uh, negative MRI's exam. So on MRI, you can see that she has a chondral lesion of her trochlea, as well as a small chondral lesion on her medial femoral condyle. Arthroscopy shows this. She has a 2.3 by uh, two, two by three centimeter lesion on the trochlea and then a small lesion on her medial femoral condyle. So we're talking about a two uh, multifocal lesions in the knee. Last case is a 29 year old female with, who's a hospital pharmacist, um, avid hiker, used to be an avid basketball player, played collegiate basketball um, and goes to the gym daily, but has noted that she's gradually slowed down over the last 10 years. Um, but she presented with six months of acute knee pain, acute on chronic knee pain. So she's always has medial knee pain, but now it's worse where she, it actually hurts when she walks. Um, complex history, ACL reconstruction with a hamstring autograph 13 years ago, and there was revised um, a year later to a BTB auto, actually six months later. Um, and then she had a medial meniscectomy about 10 years ago um, in her first year of collegiate basketball was a subtitle meniscectomy. And she had realistic goals. She wanted to walk without pain. Ideally, she would like to play basketball, but knew that ultimate goal was just to walk without pain. On exam, uh, she had no effusion. She had full range of motion. She was tender along the medial joint line, ligamentously stable and no McMurray's exam. Um, she does have some joint space narrowing on x-ray. She has some varus malalignment um, and it appears that she's not having much of a meniscus uh, left on the MR. So diagnostic scopes showed that she had deficiency in the medial meniscus. Her ACL was intact, um, but she did have a full thickness defect of the medial femoral condyle, as well as one kissing on the posterior medial tibial plateau. So let's go into what we talk about, and you guys have seen this, uh, what type of treatment options do you have for cartilage defects of the knee? We can go anywhere from palliation up through restoration. So chondroplasty, debridement, um, to basically see if they can get better for if there's any mechanical symptoms or if you have an athlete in season, to repair lesions where you can do drilling, some microfracture, some microfracture augmentation with different scaffolds that are out there. 
And then finally, you can do restoration, which is includes any cell-based therapies as well as um, graft, so osteochondral graft, autograft, or allograft transfers. So the indications for MACI um, or for cell-based therapy in this country uh, are all areas of the knee. So this includes the condyles, the trochlears, the patellas, um, and anything that's a surface area greater than two square centimeters, so something one by one or two by one, and anything less than six millimeters in depth um, is for the cells only. Anything more than that, you're looking at bone in addition to cells. Um, if it's greater than 60 millimeters, you can do something called a sandwich technique, which is putting bone graft in there. Um, and so the question is, who's, who's the ideal pa patient? So I've given you three, patient, three patients that I see, that I've seen. So how are these gonna be an ideal patient? So you wanna look at a patient who has a moderate to large uh, defect, full thickness defect, they have pain, they're symptomatic, right? The key is that they're symptomatic between 18 years of age to 55, um, and someone who can be compliant. Um, Seth kind of joked that a lot, of America, a lot of our patient population in America may not be that compliant as compared to some of the European ones, but the key is to understand that the patient's able to perform a rehabilitation protocol and be realistic. You know, if, they're, if you are resurfacing their entirety of their joint, they're not gonna be go, going back to their Ironman triathlon where they're just pounding on it. Um, and then also you wanna think about what type of personal considerations, what kind of jobs they do, what kind of athletic expectations they have. So steps for treatment, um, oftentimes we debate about a you know, two-step two procedure or a single-step procedure. For me, as, as a cartilage surgeon, I, I, the, I look, it is a two-step procedure, but I think the first step is actually part of the diagnosis. So this is where we put in the scope and arthroscopy, and so you can characterize the lesion, get an idea of where the lesion is, the size, the depth, where it engages, what degree of flexion. You can uh, debride, it at the, debride it at that time and obtain a chondral biopsy. Then you want to do the next stage of the procedure, which is where you're going to address any issues of stability, alignment, and the meniscus. So like the three pillars, if you will. Um, so in the United States, we have the insurance process, um, which is taken care of by this company called My Cartilage Care. So um, it almost makes it seamless in terms of how to get authorization. So the data that from the company that's shown that from between January and December of last year, the, there was an 85% success in terms of approval on the first submission. Uh, turnover time is about a month at most. Um, and of those that were, of the 15% that were denied, 5% of those were approved on the appeal, 7% were not appealed, and then three were denied after appeal. So you can see that it's fairly successful in terms of getting it approved in the United States. Um, and as of February 2021, so just two months ago, uh, one of the biggest healthcare carriers in the United States has expanded to, to accept um, and, and uh, okay the use of Macy in, in their patients. So overall, I would say that um, it is almost much easier to obtain authorization um, and get this approved for implantation. So going back to our cases, our case one treatment is, um, we have uh, an isolated large metaphomacondyl lesion. Patient is in mild varus, but is equal in alignment on both knees. Um, his ligament is stable, intact meniscus, and but this is an uncontained lesion. So this is a slightly un. Um, <laughs> sorry. So this is a, a slightly complex case, but it is an isolated chondral lesion. So um, we talk about surgical principles, and you've seen if you've been on any of these ICRS webinars, you know that um, this is how we address surgical um, the. Uh, the uh, lesion from a surgical standpoint, you want to obtain, this is an open procedure, you want to obtain nice vertical borders, so to nice healthy cartilage, you want to debreed the subchondral, debreed the calcified cartilage layer down to the subchondral bone. And then in this case, um, there was an interlesion ossified. So if you can see in the center picture, there's an area of that bone that looks a little bit abnormal. So what I did was take out that sclerotic bone using a burr all the way down to healthier cancellous bone. So if you haven't seen this before, you can either custom and freehand your lesion site. So you can use um, the end of a foil packet of a suture and then uh, fit it to your lesion and then cut your membrane on top of that. Or nowadays they have um, Macy templates. So you can use custom cutters, which um, if, uh, if you're in Europe, then you've seen these in a different set, but um, this will allow you to get nice sharp vertical walls. You get a very precise Macy fit and you can have minimal handling of the tissue, which is really nice. Uh, the nice part about these are also if you if you can get these to template your preparation and implantation has been shortened tremendously as opposed to freehanding everything. Um, another critical 
uh, critical step is to really look at the subchondral bone. Um, so this is where I said that, um, so that first picture was under tourniquet. This is now after uh, I've taken the tourniquet down and look at how much bleeding there is. So you wanna make sure that the blood, the bleeding is controlled. So I, this case, um, because I went deeper, I did use a fibrin uh, glue clot to stop the bleeding. And then with lesions that are that large and that are uh, uncontained, I actually will suture them in with a 6-0 vicryl suture. You can kind of see it here, this kind of little um, clear thing at the edge. Um, that is my suture, but um, ideally I'd like to use dyed suture, but um, this is what my hospital has. And as my eyes are getting older, I'd probably going to ask for the dyed suture so they can see it a little bit better. So in follow-up, a uh, patient uh, three months post-op was putting on his pants. Um, so he was returning back to function and following the rehab protocol, but he had a lot had a lot pop in his knee. I got an MRI. It looks like he tore his meniscus. So, um, and he had mechanical symptoms. So at six months post-op, we went back in. And so this is a second look, looking at how much of that Macy, that cell-based therapy uh, covered that lesion. So you can see along the area where he had the meniscus tear, he did have some um, scraping off of the implant, but overall the implant looked really good. So we let we decided to kind of leave it alone and see how he would declare itself uh, down the road. Case number two is a multifocal lesion. Remember her case was um, complicated by uh, chronic regional pain syndrome, but uh, overall, she did, was, had, did have a symptomatic uh, trochlear lesion, ligamentously stable, no, mal no malalignment, meniscus was intact. So I did have a second look um, surgeries with her because at seven months post-op, she did have a lot of arthrofibrosis, similar to all her other surgeries before. So we took her, debrided her knee and manipulated her uh, very gently. But you can see that at seven months, this is what the trochlear looks like in terms of how much infill there is. And then the mitochondrial lesion is pretty much filled completely. Um, Interestingly enough, she went back to play and then she actually developed a new hobby of very competitive mountain biking and she felt like she uh, clicked her knee and did something odd. So uh, it was found that she had a meniscus tear of a lot of meniscus. So I was able to go back in four years later and you can see what the lesion is on the trochlea, the good infill, completely asymptomatic, looked beautiful, and then also the medifrontal condyle. She did have a lot of meniscus tear that I debrided. And finally, the last one, varus malalignment. Um, so this is as complex as you can make it, right? So she had varus malalignment, she had meniscus insufficiency and a chondral defect. So this is kind of showing you that you can also use this tool for cell-based therapy and correction and alignment, uh, giving her new meniscus and then implanting a, a cell-based therapy uh, thing. So rehab-wise, I know probably need to wrap this up, but uh, rehab is also as important as the case as Tomas kind of alluded to. Uh, rehab is more than 50%, I think, in terms of success. So in the acute period, you want to protect the joint, allow the implant to adhere, the cells to adhere, and they proliferate. The next three months, you want to make sure that they're building strength so that they can transition. The cells will proliferate. They build their matrix. You still want to protect that. The final phase, you, um, you can uh, make them more functional. So between six and nine months, so that's where remodeling occurs, where the matrix builds that silly putty stage, um, and then you get progressive hardening of that matrix. Um, and then it's just kind of the idea of what you do in the first phase is just very, just functional goals in terms of getting the knee to come back to home base. You want to get rid of the swelling, get rid of the swelling, uh, as well as uh, the pain. The next stage, you want to get them a little bit more strong. So you, you want to have them work on balance and strength, uh, take them off crutches and normalize your gait. In the final stage, you want to get them back to the athletic level. So thank you. Thank you, Max. Sandra, for your very interesting talk. I will just start the question time with a simple question. Is there any difference between the rehabilitation in a patient treated by Macy on the condyle uh, lesion respect to patellar lesion in your practice, of course? Yes, absolutely. So I think the important part is understanding where the lesions are and where they engage. So that's where the diagnostic arthroscopy is important to kind of plan out how your rehab protocol is going to be. So on condylar lesions, uh, depending on the size and location, um, it's usually a touchdown weight bearing, protected and embraced, uh, at least in this country. Um, but for patellas and trochleas, anything in patellofemoral joint, I will actually let them full weight bear and full extension. I will put them in a brace just to keep that knee in extension so that they don't bend the knee and, and load that patellofemoral joint. But um, so each of the lesions you have to um, stand, you have to um, personalize that rehab protocol. Okay. And another question, is there a maximum size over which you would choose a different treatment option, Redner Macy? You told two square centimeters, 
on for deciding to go on missing, but there is a maximum size over which you do, for example, an osteogondral allograft? So I think that's a very interesting question. I think this is where there's probably a lot of controversy. I think in my hands, I would say the beauty of Macy is that you can address multifocal lesions, very large lesions, uncontained lesions. So it has a lot more flexibility to address um, different lesions of the joint, as opposed to if I have an osteochondral graft, you know, if it's a small graft or a small lesion, I, I potentially would do an osteochondral autograft as opposed to an osteochondral allograft. Um, I think if it's non-contained or even like in patella or trochlea, I think that for me pushes me more towards um, a cell-based therapy just because of the flexibility of this procedure. Okay. Verona, can I ask one question? Of course you can. Excellent. I have a first part for Ignacio. So uh, you heard the Macy data, why not uh, HA and uh, BMAC? And so you can answer that, but uh, coming back to Cassandra, I really wanna um, learn your thresholds for when it's too much, like as far as age, uh, BMI, alignment parameters that you correct, uh, and uh, Kelgren Lawrence grade. Maybe Cassandra first, and then Ignacio can, can uh, take, a, take a stab at it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Seth, thank you. Um, I think looking at like which patient is ideal, I think ideally BMI is gonna be in the less than 30 range, but the, real, the reality in, in the United States is we're probably on average around 30 as opposed to uh, other countries. So um, I will ask some patients to try to lose some weight to at least show that they're dedicated towards that goal of getting their knee better. And I've had a couple successes where people have dropped their BMIs by like five to 10, it's been pretty impressive. Um, uh, with regards to malalignment, I think that's the difficult part, so looking at males versus females um, and how much they're going to tolerate. So that's another part of it, understanding that if you don't maximally uh, mechanically improve the, that area, then that your cell-based therapy is not, is not going to succeed, right? So that, that's where the long and hard talk comes from. Um, and then ligaments, uh, meniscus, clearly you want to improve the mechanical environment. And it, in terms of threshold of how big, um, a lot of times patients are actually coming in, they're very educated, right? There's, you know, Dr. Google is out there. So they come in asking for specific um, treatments and, you know, you can give them all, all the information and allow them to understand that, yeah, this might be the threshold where you can't make it, but, you know, that's what they're in their mind that they want. Um, and they want to try that before ultimately succumbing to a total knee. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree with Cassandra. Uh, I think that the take-home message here is to treat the knee as an organ, not only uh, the lesion. Uh, of course, we need to address comorbidities such malalignment, um, obesity, and these kind of problems to have success. But regarding the study of Dr. Gobi, who published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, a 10 years follow-up, um, HIV-MAC is a good option not only for um, simple lesions, but also for lesions in multiple compartments. But of course, the best results are in younger patients. Thank you. We have also two questions from the audience. The first one, Givan Pereira. Did you have a case where there was a recurrent patella dislocation with shallow trochlea? And if yes, how do you manage it? Yes. Um, Patellar dislocations are often a um, indication to do this procedure since a lot of times they'll knock off a chunk of cartilage somewhere. So um, a lot of times I will actually address this with client, depending on looking at all the parameters, right? You might be looking at tubular tubercle osteotomy, MPFL reconstruction. I don't necessarily do a trochleoplasty. That's usually my last kind of line of uh, defense, but typically I would probably address the tibial tubercle osteotomy with MPFL reconstruction and also uh, implantation at the same time. Okay, one quick, last quick question about the maximum depth of the bony defects. Someone, you say it's six millimeters, someone is saying 10 millimeters. What do you think about? We can push up to 10 or it's too much? I think that is pretty controversial. I mean, I can tell you that I have had, in, I have put in um, around six millimeters and I had it fail. So I don't know if I would believe the one centimeter. So I think it's just, um, I think six millimeters is what the company has uh, suggested, but certainly if you can, I, I don't know enough about the biology to tell you that, but I think one centimeter would be a little bit more on the aggressive side. And I don't know if I would be comfortable with that as a surgeon. Thank you very much, Cassandra. I think we should move to the last speaker, 
who is our boss, already introduced, Dr. Sherman, who will talk about early experience with patient-specific osteotomy. Please, set. Thank you. Let me try to advance. Can you guys see this and hear me? Fine, thank you. Excellent. So um, I uh, wrote a newsletter recently in the ICRS newsletter about my early experience with patient-specific uh, instrumentation and osteotomy. And I just wanted to share some of those experiences with you. Uh, like many of you, um, you may have felt from your training confined by conventional osteotomy, at least in America. We learned medial wedge uh, opening uh, for HTOs. We learned lateral opening for DFOs. We did one plane corrections. Uh, most of us here in America, maybe have more experience abroad, uh, would do stage ligament reconstructions. And as I got more mature in my practice into my second uh, decade now, which is crazy, um, I'm getting more complex and salvage patients, uh, more chronic issues, and really Really need more innovative solutions and better tools to get there. I started thinking of reasons why I might want to do closing wedge HTOs or uh, lateral versus medial and same uh, uh, medial closing uh, versus lateral opening on the femur. Uh, we're all learning about biplanar cuts to increase stability. Um, and I think a key concept to PSI is really one plane cuts but an actual two plane correction. So depending on where you put your hinge point, you can actually change both coronal and sagittal alignment. Extremely powerful, particularly uh, with cartilage, uh, meniscus and stability issues, which are a lot of my patients. I've found that I'm more comfortable doing concomitant ligaments, planning for meniscus roots, planning out um, uh, meniscus transplant tunnels. I also find that this is more thoughtful preoperative planning. I get to sit before the surgery and think about the entire limb, make all the measurements, see what's good, what's not good. Think about patella height, ramifications of my cuts above the tubercle, lower. I think about and look for the aberrant artery every time on the imaging as part of my checklist. My fellows are involved in this. It's a teaching tool and it's very uh, excellent 3D models. And so that's kind of the impetus for me getting into this. Um, clearly, there's some data on the accuracy and repeatability of the patient-specific instrument. So it works. It can get us there. It's safe and secure. Uh, actually, now for the straightforward ones, and even for complex cases, the OR time is decreased. The amount of x-rays I take is decreased. And depending on the type of case complexity, it can be suitable for the general sports doc or, frankly, for the knee joint preservation uh, expert. Uh, we all want to protect the hinge. We hate that sound. Um, and so there are different methods uh, uh, to do this. Uh, one method is uh, kind of protecting it with this golden pin. And you can see here, uh, and you can uh, PSI really precisely that hinge point and protect that hinge at all costs. So I think that's very uh, uh, interesting. Uh, here's the process. So basically, it takes about four or five weeks. Uh, we do x-rays. We do a CT. It goes to uh, whatever company you're working with. Uh, they give you a pre-plan based on your specifications, then it gets 3D printed along with a packet, uh, which gives you precise information for the surgical day. So here's kind of that 3D model. Uh, here's uh, some of the images so we can look at the cut and correction. We can look at the placement of the plate and the screws. We can look at the height from the joint line. We can look at the relationship to the tibial tubercle. We have a ton of measurements uh, to check and to recheck. Um, you can see here, I know my saw blade uh, lengths. Uh, I know exactly where my hinge point uh, will be. Um, and uh, we can also uh, know our screw length. We can plan for ACL tunnels. Uh, we can plan to avoid the screws. Um, uh, we actually can uh, instrument uh, uh, two plane um, kind of stopgap guides like this. So once it's in, you know that you've uh, done your correction in your coronal and sagittal plane. Uh, you can get more elaborate taking the tubercle off, doing rotation. So there's a lot of room to grow here. And I think that's really, really exciting. Uh, just want to show some of my early cases. So here's a 51 year old. He's a military guy. He essentially has moderate medial arthritis. He had a scope clean out. He failed conservative treatment. He had temporary relief with unloader bracing. He has classic uh, moderate um, uh, medial based arthritis, as you see on the left knee and varus malalignment. And so for him, it's a one plane correction. It was almost 10 degrees. Um, we plan uh, with the software. I know all of my uh, cuts. You can see my two golden uh, pins protecting that hinge at all costs. And then we can see the plan and then we can execute that plan precisely, not changing his slope uh, and uh, improving his coronal alignment. 
Here's another case, a 33 year old failed a revision ACL with a BTB autograph and a medial meniscus transplant. He had um, functional instability and medial based pain. He had a grade 2B Lachman and a grade 2 pivot shift and medial joint line tenderness. For this patient, he had uh, some medial-based arthritis. Uh, he had no issues with uh, tibial slope. Um, you can see here he has asymmetric varus. And uh, his MRI shows no um, meniscus, some osteophytes, and some uh, bipolar uh, chondrosis medially, and no ACL with reasonable tunnels. And so for this one, it's a uniplanar coronal correction to neutral and a same time revision ACL with a quad autograph. I had no reason to two stage uh, this particular case. And so we can plan with the autograph uh, where it will go, how those screws will diverge. We uh, did not change the slope in this case. And we were able to nicely and safely uh, execute the plan uh, to get this patient what he needs in one stage. I think these are x-rays at three months. Uh, he's probably out six months now uh, and continues to do quite well. Here's another case, a 27 year old. He had multiple failed ACLs. He complains mostly of functional instability. He has a real big problem list. We did a staging scope. We bone grafted his tibial tunnel. He has both medial and lateral meniscus deficiency and early to moderate chondrosis. And so he has a very sloppy knee, as you can see a lot of sagittal translation and an explosive pivot shift. When you look at his measures, he has coronal malalignment, he's in valgus. He has sagittal malalignment. He has increased slope. And so for me, I was able to plan a biplanar medial tibia closing wedge. We were able to get that slope down less than 12. We corrected his coronal to neutral between the spines. We did a repeat revision ACL with quad autograft. I added a lateral extraarticular tenodesis with ITB autograft. And then I basically set the stage with good stability and alignment if needed to come back to treat the cartilage surfaces or to do one or both meniscus transplants. Not a right way to skin this cat, probably others might do it differently, but this is the path we chose together and um, you know how it goes. So here is the pre-planning. So basically uh, we can uh, precisely plan the amount of bone we wanna resect. We can plan where our hinge point is. Uh, this is my operating room uh, setup. Uh, here you can see the guide in place, nice minimally invasive uh, salvage procedure. Uh, you can see after the closing uh, wedge, this was a biplanar cut behind the tibial tubercle, very, very stable. And then you can see the revision ACL with quadriceps autograph, the larger uh, button in that location. Uh, and then there's the lateral collateral ligament and uh, taking the IT band under it and fixing it uh, more proximal. Here you can see his x-rays. So we have neutral alignment. We've corrected his slope. His uh, closing wedge healed like gangbusters. We could uh, actually weight bear on it um, uh, more readily. And so uh, my last uh, case, uh, as these increase in complexity uh, and get my heart rate uh, going, if I was trying to do these freehand, uh, I think I would have done some plan way, way different because uh, um, I didn't have the courage or the tools. But uh, here's a 38-year-old male. He had a motor vehicle accident. He had six prior surgeries, including PCL reconstruction. He has severe anterior and medial pain. He also has functional instability. He has a positive posterior drawer and tenderness over his patella. You can see uh, here, he has a very flat tibial slope. Uh, he has pretty good coronal uh, alignment. Um, we can see that he has a destroyed patellofemoral joint at a very young age. Um, you can see images here that PCL is there, maybe not in the optimal position, but definitely collagen uh, that's still in the notch and patellofemoral arthritis. So for him, we did a biplanar opening wedge plan to increase his tibial slope and to correct his coronal just slightly to neutral, just because we, we could, um, and an unloading tibial tubercle anteriorization. And so here's what this looks like. To the left, we take off the tubercle in the center and on the right, we plan our hinge uh, for that slope changing operation. Note that the hinge is way more posterior. It is not, uh, and it is not a straight lateral, which would be a one plane correction. Uh, here you can see some more images of the planification. Uh, you can see our execution uh, where we've increased uh, that slope uh, precisely to where uh, we want it to be. 
Um, and uh, at this point, uh, he's doing well. I think he's about uh, two months out um, uh, healing, a uh, long road ahead, uh, obviously no promises. Uh, uh, and he will, he has been counseled that he likely needs future procedures, but hopefully we can buy him some time with this um, technique. Uh, so I hope I've showed you in a short period of time that PSI is exciting and innovative. It's stepwise and an intuitive learning curve. Um, we can think and act creatively to solve complex patient problems, and it's an excellent teaching uh, tool. And so I thank you for your attention. Uh, I will stop sharing and happy to take any thoughts or comments uh, from uh, our panel. Thank you very much, Seth, for this beautiful introduction to the patient-specific approach. And I, I would like one comment from you. Uh, from your cases, I've noticed that there are a lot of patients with failed ligament reconstruction, which in my opinion is due to the lack of consideration to the alignment of the, of the limb. So uh, this is a consequence of an undone osteotomy. What do you think about? An osteotomy yeah. done before could prevent ligament injury, re injury. Yeah, I think whenever we have these patients with the failed ACL and the failed failure, uh, you know, we really need to do a thoughtful root cause analysis. And there are patient factors, there's limb factors, there's joint factors, and we make a problem list. And it's very important for us to learn why it failed, right? A lot of times, for us at least, uh, it's tunnel position. It's poor graft choice in a young person. And so those are kind of the most common. And then sometimes it's well done first surgery uh, or poorly done first surgery with bad rehab, too soon return, right? So those situations, maybe I don't have to do anything bigger. I just have to stick to my primary ACL principles and use a BTB or use a primary quad. However, if I go through the algorithm and those things check off, or if it's obvious that their slope is above 12, or they have no break stop, no medial meniscus in varus, uh, or things like that, or cartilage issues, then I need to become more thoughtful uh, using osteotomy. So I guess to simplify, I look for those low hanging fruit first and try to do my standard operation. Um, if I can't uh, do that, uh, then uh, I, I kind of look further. I don't do osteotomy routinely in primary ACL reconstruction if anyone uh, you know is, is asking. Okay. So uh, I see a question from the audience. Uh, Jivan Pereira, did all these patients have BMI issues along with limb malalignment? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, I think that uh, as I've brought closing wedges into my arsenal, uh, I'm a little more lenient uh, with uh, osteotomy for a little heavier patient. Uh, I try to encourage them uh, through uh, help working with our nutrition partners, like Cassandra talked about, to lose weight um, uh, and then low impact exercise. But uh, for opening wedges uh, or for these ligaments or when I add meniscus transplant or cartilage, uh, I, I have pretty strict BMI criteria, uh, and I think that lingers around 30 uh, or below. Um, so a lot of them need uh, some pre-rehabilitation. They need unloader braces. They need medications and biologic injections. They need to sign on to my plan. That's a longer term plan because this joint preservation world is not a uh, home run. See you later. There's baked into this more procedures. There's baked into this, you know, longer time frame. So I think we have to tell people all of that uh, before we go. Okay. Question from the panel. Yeah, um, I have a question uh, to say or uh, just a comment. Could you uh, explain briefly what is the advantage of using this personal specific approach uh, comparing to the traditional osteotomy? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest advantages uh, are just in, um, as you kind of saw, the, I think the thoughtful pre-planning uh, and the courage uh, or the opportunity to know that if you plan two plane corrections or adding a ligament or a root repair that you've thought about it before. And then in the operating room, we have um, the ability to really translate that plan uh, precisely uh, versus using a bovi cord or using fluoroscopy or just seeing that it's okay or trying to jack up the back with a bone graft and not knowing if you've messed with the coronal. So I think all those things are, are, are what gives it advantage. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I do not 
at all look at in the operating room with this technique, when the pegs line up, I'm done. I have my correction. So I'm not really worried. Uh, as long as I know the PSI is in the right position initially, my golden pin looks good like the picture, my hooks hook, my level from the joint line is where it looks like it should be, my other guides above the tubercle, uh, then really I cut confidently and I open confidently or close confidently. And once the pegs go in, uh, you know that it's exactly where you planned. And, and that's just really powerful um, and different, uh, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any plan to adopt this uh, technology also for femoral osteotomy? Do you have any experience on, already on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I wish I did yesterday. I did a uh, femoral derotation for a very extreme version case, and it was my first time doing something like that. Uh, I should have pre-planned it because I'll tell you, uh, not uh, PSIing that transverse cut and getting it right in both planes is a feat. Uh, and so uh, they do have it for uh, distal femoral osteotomy. Uh, my next step for standard distal femoral osteotomy will be to use the actual biplanar cut so that anterior cut so that it's more stable. I haven't done that freehand. Uh, and also, uh, I think I'll have more courage to uh, do medial closing distal femoral, which I've never really done in practice. Uh, I've only done lateral opening. So I'm excited to just get those patients and I'm confident that I'll be able to execute that within the next six months to year uh, without uh, issue. Okay. I understand correctly, it's just the jig, which is patient specific, not the plate and screw. Yeah, very important. Uh, there's different companies out there. Um, this is one particular one, but for this one, this is planning with the jig and then the plate and screw are not patient specific, although uh, they are built into the software so that when things line up for this specific plate, you know what your corrections are. So you can't just use necessarily any uh, old plate, although if you had that wedge I showed uh, that you put into the correction gap, then I think you could use any plate you wanted, but it's just straightforward, built into the software to use the plate that goes with the PSI. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I think we are running out of time. So quick I question, have, please. Sorry, I have the question. Seth, could you tell me, uh, what is your limitation border of the age when you think we, we should do everything for save the knee osteotomy, transport, meniscus, cartilage, uh, if we see really, for example, arthrosis of the medial compartment after um, previous meniscectomy, and come to be a patient yeah. with their I, limitation of the age. I think that's a great question. Uh, I live in California now, which is a little different than Missouri. So age really is not a number. It's physiologic and also bone age and also activity level. So it's a moving target. Um, I would say uh, that um, as patients get older and have more narrowing and more arthrosis, my threshold to just do osteotomy and not add meniscus transplants or cartilage, I think uh, um, is, I always wanna just do that uh, um, and not have to do all of the above. So I think you can get away with osteotomy alone in a lot of those tweeners. Uh, I think if some of them are low, lower demand or just too frail, or just, you know, they can't handle an osteotomy and they're not ready for a uh, uni compartment or total, those are tough, and I think there's things in the FDA pipeline coming out for that specific patient population. Um, but I'm not quick to do meniscus transplants or cartilage or bipolar cartilage in any of those uh, those 45, you know, 50 and above uh, relatively sedentary people. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's time to close. Ignacio, any final remark from you? No, just to say thanks all the audience for joining us in this exciting webinar. And the floor is yours, Berardo, to, to finish and close this fantastic meeting. We close with an invitation for you all to join us for the next ICRS webinar, which will be held on Saturday, May 15th. And the title will be Managing the Spectrum of Articular Cartilage and Meniscal Deficiency. And you will, you will have the opportunity to listen to distinguished speakers like Brian Cole, Jack Farr, and Andreas Gomol.
So we invite you all to join us on May. And again, thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.